what the culture tells us day in and day out. It is not possible. And you see the effect of this in what is going on in the uh, mainstream capitalist world. You have the Wall Street crash in 2008, bankruptcy of financialization, neoliberal ideas, neoliberal politics, people blame the banks, concentrating fire on the banks, which is of course totally correct, but miss out the fact that the people who gave the bankers these powers was the politicians. That it was a combined ruling class. It wasn't just a few bankers going crazy and saying, hey, should we do this as well? Should we you know, do futures or just do retail banking? It wasn't that. It was, this is the way that capitalism is going to go. And they decided effectively to destroy the workers' movement. You know, not openly, not through brutalities, but defeating strikes and moving. Someone once asked me, I can't remember, I think it's either in the uh, somewhere in Illinois on the West Coast, what do you think about the American working class now? And I said the bulk of it is working in China. <laughs> that is what is happening. And that is what has happened. It wasn't at all necessary, but it was happened to maintain and uh, uh, preserve capitalist profits. In, in the countries, a combination of financialization and using reserve armies of labor in huge third world countries. And that, of course, has not played out as yet, by the way, neither China nor India. There the game is not over, it's barely starting. Because you now have the largest proletariat in the world in China. You have large numbers of Western countries, if not the bulk of the continents, dependent on cheap commodities from China. And if that blows, which it could well in the next 10 years in some shape or form, or say, to be more pessimistic, 20 years, the effect of that is going to be global. The effect of that is going to be global. Have no doubt about it. Likewise in India, it's not a settled, stable state. And what you're not having in China and India are what they were all said, you know, it was going to happen. That of course we will have the European uh, 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 development replicated in China and India, peasants coming into the towns, the creation of a new wonderful urban civilization based on democracy, this, that and the other, like hell it is. <laughs> In fact, the Chinese have demonstrated very concretely that there is no link between democracy and capitalism, that you can run an extremely dynamic capitalist state without giving an inch of democracy or democratic rights to anyone. So this one central theme of bourgeois ideology throughout the 20th century, democracy and capitalism go together, dictatorship and communism or socialism go together, is absolute rubbish. But it's rubbish based on historical facts, of course, for which <clears throat> we're, still, we're still paying the price. And the way they won these countries back to capital and Western investments was essentially uh, through maneuvers and negotiations. I mean, the Chinese did their own business by saying, you know, we are going to introduce capitalism under our own control. Whether you like them or not, that is what they are doing. And they claim this, they can change, and it's true, the state has much more control over what is happening in China. In, in Russia, the party in bureaucracy, totally bankrupted, had no way looking forward to the future, just caved in. They didn't even ask anything in return, not even the disbandment of NATO, which they could have demanded saying, we're going to disband the Warsaw Pact. Let's do this for starters, to show your goodwill. We're going to disband the Warsaw Pact, you disband NATO. Then we we'll talk about what will happen in East Germany. No, 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 it was not that. It was on their knees before the West, saying, we love you, we really want to be like you, help us. And the, this happened virtually all over <coughs> Eastern Europe. 
And there's, a, you know, uh, uh, a very interesting passage in Trotsky's book, which was published here as The Revolution Betrayed, but its actual title is Where is Russia Going? In which he said that the two choices facing Russia in the foreseeable future are either it moves towards socialism and democracy, socialist democracy, or, he said, sections of the bureaucracy will basically sell out and become capitalists, private capitalists as we know them. This was written in, in the early 30s, pretty much vindicated. Because a lot of these joker mafia millionaires you see creating mayhem on the streets of uh, New York and London or their agents, most of them, were members of, in the case of the uh, Russian billionaires in London who own football clubs and newspapers and stuff, they were usually, they were quite a lot of them were activists in the Young Communist League in Russia. That's their, that's their background. And they talk about it. They say, yeah, well, we did learn how to run organizations. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to, to conclude in, you know, is despite the 2008 crisis, nowhere in Europe or North America has there been any attempt by any mainstream party, center left, center right, to say enough is enough. This can't go on because our people are suffering and we are not, you know, just a simple thing. We are not going to allow the rich to benefit permanently, not to pay taxes, to have their special bank accounts in safe havens, to rob, to steal, to pay themselves huge bonuses. We're not going to allow this. this quite honestly, what I'm saying is not even that radical. It is capitalist legality. <laughs> But they won't even legalize their own system properly because they are fearful that if the state begins to intervene again and save some parts of the structures which should carry on existing, this applies more to Europe than the United States, but even here. Who knows what could happen? People might get uh, encouraged to demand more. It could change the political situation. It could lead to a change in consciousness. Better not to go in that direction. So the direction they're going in is more of the same. Just carry on doing what we were doing. And this is creating mayhem. Uh, one of the theorists of this mayhem, who I ran into New York yesterday, Michael Hart, said to me, I said, Europe is in a really bad state. And he said, but why is being ungovernable bad? <laughs> and I said, being ungovernable is bad because if there is no left or progressive organization, the people who benefit from this unge ungovernability are by and large the right. And I took him through what's happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I said, that's what happens. You know, you think a bunch of clowns have won in Italy. Well, the guy is a clown, but he's a sinister clown. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an innocent thing. The ideology behind all this is elitist and quite right wing. Just like the Pirates Party in Germany and in Sweden. It's not innocence. And quite a lot of them are already being infiltrated by people. And in Greece, the Golden Dawn is a self-about Nazi organization. There's no two ways about it. And in France, you have a huge social and political crisis at the moment. And the large manifestations which take place, organized by the right and the Catholic Church, are against gay marriages. A million people marched in Paris against gay marriage, against gay weddings, which have been legalized. And this is a country which is supposed to be secular. This is a country which bans Muslim women from wearing the hijab if they want to. And they're showing their secularity and their republicanness by marching a million people out on the streets, a million, against gays. 
and no march, no demonstration against the huge unemployment figures, against the total failure of the Socialist Party. It's true, they, I think they're going to organize, there should be this week, a big demonstration for a new republic, the Sixth Republic. We'll see how many people that gets. I don't think there's going to be a million coming out for that, saying, get rid of this entire corrupt structure, Let's have a new constituent assembly to prepare a new constitution which takes the presidential powers away, gives powers back to parliament, not one semi-monarchical president. It's a popular, you know, it's a good thing the left is doing. And we'll see what happens. It's not the center left, it's the far left and its allies who are doing this, but good. It's at least doing something. But within mainstream politics, there is no movement at all. And this, I think, is going to lead to much more unpleasantness that we've seen. And so, you know, when I'm asked to speak all over Europe, which I am often, I say, you know, I have to say this to you, that the solution is socialism. And I don't mean this in a sort of abstract way, a utopian socialism, no. I mean the state and work working class people and public sector workers have to do something to safeguard their interests, the interests of the poor, the interests of the unemployed, the interests of kids who can't afford to pay for their education. The number of working class kids going into universities all over Europe has come right down. Who is going to defend them? So that is the level of uh, the debate. And that is why there's so much hatred and anger and fear of Chavez, actually. Because, you know, I've written about him at length, I knew him very well, and he was very clear in what he was doing. It was essentially a left social democratic program. I mean, they use rhetoric, this is the revolution, fine, good. But effectively, that's what it was. And that is the example they really wanted to wipe out. Not permitted. Verboten. So you saw, I mean, it's astonishing, the uniformity of views and opinions about Chavez in the American and European media. Virtually the same. In, you know, in Britain it's slightly different. We still have the Guardian. Uh, but in France, all the papers, Le Monde devoted three pages of pure poison. <coughs> El Pais the same. Germans marginally more nuanced. But that had the American of beyond belief, but then we know that, and the American television networks likewise. But this is why no alternative is permitted. And this is why we have to struggle in small and big ways for that alternative, because quite honestly, if we don't, the people who are organizing all over the place in different ways, whether it's through the church and religion, or openly is semi-fascist, or is right-wing populist, is the right. They are on the march, and the left is extremely weak. And one reason the left is weak is because many of them hang on to the coattails of the center-left, in my opinion. It's, I mean, you look at this country. You know, 90% of the things Obama is doing, had they been done by Bush, there would have been uproar. Absolute uproar if Bush had arrogated powers to kill any American citizen at will. Right. Effectively removed civil liberties from the agenda of American politics. <coughs> there would have been uproar if there had been a hunger strike of Guantanamo right. prisoners under Bush. Right. Right. In fact, Bush released more Guantanamo prisoners than Obama has done. Just a fact, by the way. More drone attacks on Pakistan under the, Obama in the first two years than throughout the Bush term. And yet American liberalism is it's just sort of dying on its feet. They can't see this happening. And what this creates is effectively a precedent. The next time a Republican gets elected and does this, you won't have a leg to stand on, not you people here, but I mean those who have just decided to back Obama. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, he's a Democrat, I guess, and he's mixed race, and he looks good. But, I mean, not sufficient reason. And politics has gone out of the window. And that is, in a different way, these politics are being refracted in Europe. 
I mean, I, I, I do not exaggerate. You know this vacuous slogan by Obama, yes we can, which even he in private admits is vacuous. It was used by an Italian leader of the left party during the last campaign, Veltroni, in English to Italian. <laughs> yes we can! <laughs> What the hell is going on? I mean, you know, have you got nothing else to say? And the answer is no, they haven't. They haven't. All they want to do is run the system, make money, and so it's yes, we can. We can make more money. Uh, if we are in power, we are the people backing us will benefit. Uh, Berlusconi's benefited for a long time. Exactly the same thing happening in Britain. Blair's turned out to be the most, one of the more corrupt politicians we've seen, currently on the payroll of the Kazakhstan government. And here, let me tell you an interesting story. The Kazakhstan PR people who run that country's public relations rang up Clinton, who's also on their payroll. And they said, you know, we need some Europeans. And Clinton said, why don't you try my friend Blair? <laughs> they said, fine, great. So they rang up Blair. And the Blair's office spoke to them, and they said, we'd like Tony Blair to come and meet our president uh, and, you know, be seen with him and give him advice. And the Blair's agent said, how much? <laughs> and they said, well, a million. And he said, we'll give you a reply. And they said, no. So they rang up, this is all public, by the way. So they rang up Clinton and said, you told us to, Tony Blair was willing to come on. And you know, he's fucking saying no. And Clinton said, how much did you offer him? They said, a million. I said, oh, come on, put it on. <laughs> put it up a bit. So they said, well, how much should we offer him? He said, you know, I'm not saying you should give him what you gave me, but at least offer him five. So they offered him five, deal done. Blair flies off to Kazakhstan with his old advisors from New Labour in tow. They gave me advice, they'll give you advice, and this is all going on. And meanwhile, uh, they all unite again for, to, to commemorate and mark Thatcher's legacy. Just one word on Thatcher's legacy. This legacy could have been destroyed. It was never popular, by the way. If you look at the votes with which he was elected, always a minority vote never a majority vote in the country. So the legacy was up for being destroyed. New Labour effectively built on that legacy and created the structure which is now uh, 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 Britain. It was Labour who did that. Till this day, whenever the Tories are going to privatize something, introduce more uh, neoliberal measures, Labour can't speak. When they get up, the, the Tories say, but hang on, these papers we've got from the civil servants, you, you wrote them, you guys, you approved them, and now you've got the nerve to attack us. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the Tories, and interestingly, you know, there's a huge anger in Britain that she was being given up a public funeral at public expense as if she was sort of some great entity. Huge anger. And some conservatives, MPs, privately told the media without being named, they said, well, look, we didn't want to do this. But the entire plan for the funeral was set up under Gordon Brown's government. <laughs> We're just implementing it. And, and this was absolutely so they, it, Labour even wanted to send her off like this. So the lesson from all this is bad things are happening, <laughs> and have happened, and will carry on happening, and we're living in bad times to a certain extent, but we must never give up, because, you know, <clears throat> to give up, to despair, what's the point of doing that? I mean, despair is a very passive emotion, actually. It creates passivity. Whereas hope, even in bad times, is important to keep your minds active. <laughs> Very important. And you know, you think about the midpoints of the 20th century. Were they worse than now? Yes, they bloody well were. When you had most of Europe under the Nazis, Russia under hard Stalinism, this wasn't, this was all, uh, the reforms came after 56. 
But that's what you had. The midnight of our century, as Victor Serge called it. It's not as bad as that now. So one has to be, have a sense of perspective, but it means that you know the, the need to exploit, to use every space, to take the struggle forward, some advantages we have, which we didn't have in those periods. And politics becomes extremely important. The Middle East explosions teach us that. that if you think that just having uprisings on its own is enough, it isn't. Because ultimately, people have to choose what's on offer. And so they choose these Islamist parties, socially, politically, economically conservative Islamist parties, partially because they were repressed by the dictatorships, but partially because there's nothing else on offer. And so if both in Tunisia and Egypt, it's a mess. And the lesson of this mess is not to say, oh, the uprisings are wrong, far from it. It's to say politics remains extremely important. And without politics remaining in command, or by hiding one's politics, you can't move forward. And others take over. And so this sort of, you know, quite popular theme, even very, po I mean, it's a sort of semi-anarchist theme, though that was not the problem in Egypt, by the way. But in the Occupy movements, it's, it's a similar thing. No demands. But, you know, if you don't make any demands, however modest, you can't move forward, you can't win over other people. You have to have at least a minimum charter of ten demands. This is what we need today, the country needs today. We are prepared to fight for it. To pose no demands at all is to give up. And so then you're forced to do is uh, effectively become, celebrate on the web or on paper, your successes. And the successes were that you actually occupied a space, which was great and we all supported it. But on its own, it's not enough. And observing anniversaries of it every year doesn't help either, because it actually shows up what our weaknesses are. I'll stop there. You're getting nervous. questions in the room, but I, I'm thinking maybe after this we can, you know, have some more informal discussion um, to the ladies of the sign book and check out um, the market books table in the back. So if you, and don't forget the wine and the, um, the bottles are open, so. <laughs> so we have to finish them, it's necessary. Um, okay, so if you do have a question, um, you know. Anybody worried about being on video? Um, and, uh, you know, I apologize in advance if we can't get to everyone. You can go ahead. Oh, this is a, first of all, thank you so much for your wonderful enlightening historical overview of the damage that Stalinism has done to the international movement for socialism. Uh, I am very glad that you mentioned the complexity of dealing with sexual politics of employees during context, and I'm wondering if you would say something about that in the Indian context at all, because I've been following Jagdana Shiva, who's been talking about how capitalist patriarchy, capitalist patriarchy, specifically uh, in the wake of some horrible incidents of rape in, in, in India, has been exacerbating violence against women. And uh, I'm also very going to quickly say that as a Jewish feminist and democratic socialist, there's a word that I have to add to this room when we talk about Stalinism, and that word is explicitly anti-Semitism. It's a legacy of anti-Semitism as well. Okay. Um, just very briefly uh, on both those questions. Um, India is, in, in, in social economic terms, the general image you get of India, you know, which they tried to promote for a long time, was shining India. <laughs> Capitalism is flourishing, all is well, money is trickling down. 
and the poor are not so poor. Well, if you actually look at the statistics, what you see is that there's no doubt there has been a rise in the numbers of the middle classes who have more money. But for the bulk of the Indian population, this is not the case. What is the case is there's a lot more informal labor, very precarious, very fragile, completely unorganized, uh, which in order to get work, when it can, can't live in one place. It has to move from city to city to city. So in both China and India, there is huge internal migration, but on a vast scale. Uh, and the wages they get are pretty appalling. There's a very, I mean, if you want to read more in it, I would recommend the work of a Dutch scholar, Jan Jan, J-A-N, Bremen, B-R-E-M-A-N, who's written a whole study on poverty in India, and <clears throat> whose essays are, two of his essays we published in the New Left Review, which you can get on the, on the website. As for rape in patriarchy, yeah, this is true, unfortunately, not only in India, but in uh, large parts of the world and sometimes in places where one hoped not to find it. But <clears throat> it certainly is the case. In India, at least you had a huge mobilization. But you know, one problem in India is that they still will not make rape a crime for soldiers. And some of the largest episodes of rape that take place in India are in the Northeast, in Manipur, occupied by the Indian Army, and in Kashmir, occupied by the Indian Army where the Indian military high command has fought tooth and nail to prevent laws against rape from applying to the army because they say we are operating in uh, situations, there are enemies, but you know, do you rape your enemies? I mean, um, so, and the Indian government has caved in. So this is a patriarchy very much uh, instituted uh, from the top. Uh, Stalinism and anti-Semitism. It is not the case that anti-Semitism existed in Russia on the left till later on, and then it was used effectively. And you know, uh, if you talk to scholars, Russian scholars, or scholars on Russia, they will tell you that the big change which happened which made them very nervous, wrongly, but they did. Having backed Israel and the formation of Israel, which Stalin did, uh, he then, they forgot the impact of this within Russia. And the first state visit by Golda Meir to Moscow saw a spontaneous demonstration, largely Jewish, welcoming her. And after that, the regime turned and went crazy, you know, the Jewish doctor's plot and this plot. But prior to that, it was limited. It never disappeared, but it was limited. But in terms of anti-Semitism that existed in Russia as a whole, historically, of course, it's on gigantic proportions. And people who say that it's a pity the revolution happened, some well-meaning people, and the implication is that if it hadn't been these horrible Leninists and Bolsheviks, we'd have had some nice, kind, social, Scandinavian-style <laughs> social democracy. Well, no. What you would have had would have been a military dictatorship backed by the Black Hundreds and based on, essentially, exterminism towards the Russian Jews. That's what you would have had. They would have given, uh, uh, preceded the Third Reich in doing this. So anti-Semitism, if you read Isaac Babel's short stories, by the way, during the Civil War, you get, a, you get a fairly good idea of how it was. But there's a very interesting book now out called The, uh, the Jewish Century by a Russian Jewish scholar, I've forgotten his name, uh, on the, who teaches on the West Coast. And it's a very well-researched history and in it, he says that the 20th century, there were two heavens for the Jews and there was one hell. 
And the heavens were the United States, because they could come here and make money and prosper. And the other heaven was the Soviet Union, where the revolution liberated them. In fact, the anti-Semites in Russia, I mean, the common chant was, the Jews have taken over our country. That was the anti-Semitic Black Hundreds chant. We are against the revolution because the Jews have taken the country and they used to say, look at the composition of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party or the Politburo, 80% Jewish intellectuals or workers. So this was used against the Russians, but I think his name is Levine. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I've, I've forgotten it. And he says that the rise of the Jews from the pales, from the ghettos, to not just the upper reaches of Soviet society, but on every level of it, was unprecedented and very liberating. And then he says bureaucrats, Stalin, of course, in a crazy way, and Brezhnev later, uh, made anti-Semitic measure, but the arguments Brezhnev used to use is that if we have no restrictions, then they'll take everything over because they're the most intelligent people in the country. A sort of backhanded compliment, if you like. <laughs> but saying so that we have to restrict, that we have to have a Jewish quota, which, by the way, existed in Britain right till the 60s. A whole number of schools, private schools, not state schools, used to have a Jewish quota using very Brezhnevite arguments saying, well, you know, if there's no control, the whole school would be Jewish. And you say, well, so what? But, so it's a, it's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I had a question about a really good point that's totally underreported about uh, in the United States and Europe, the increasing amount of unemployment, underemployment, and increasing uneducation now at this point. Um, historically, in your own judgment and expertise, do you have or do you know of any uh, historical cases of that work happening in the working class of unemployment, mass unemployment, in the same sort of legs of today, um, and where that leads to? Well, of course, we had it during the Great Depression in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, the 20s and 30s were periods of huge unemployment and a breakdown of the social order. This breakdown of the social order in parts of Europe created a big struggle between the left and the right, which the right won in Germany. That's what the struggle was about, a different dispensation. And the, I mean, you know, it's a long story about the victory of fascism in Germany, which was a huge disaster for the entire European working class, but that grew out of two things. One, the Depression, and prior to that, the way in which the Germans were treated after the First World War, punished, uh, not allowed their own sovereignty, completely uh, sort of kept under the control, and that, that created a, combina a national German nationalism, and then came the Depression, and you know, you had large amounts of sort of people walking on the streets unemployed, inflation rose to amazing heights, and the result was a confrontation in which the German capitalist class backed the fascists because they said a Bolshevik victory in Germany would finish us all. So we have had this experience before, and in the United States, of course, you had the following development. You had an aggressive rise of the labor movement in this country against, in the fight for trade unionizing themselves, against the post-depression uh, uh, measures that were being taken, factories were occupied. The United, the working class in the United States, in my opinion, was, well, not all of them, but their most advanced elements were politicized in the 30s like at no other time. And the New Deal was a response to that pressure from below. It was a response to the existence of the Soviet Union, too, which on paper had no unemployment. And people saw it as a model, you know, whether we like it or not. It was seen as that, and the, the, the bourgeoisie saw it as a model. And then movements from below that created the conjuncture. But even the New Deal measures were not on their own enough to stave off the Depression. This is not often discussed. What finally helped American capitalism to recover was the war. Mm -hmm. The Second World War 
actually revived the American economy much more than the measures that were taken during mm -hmm. the Depression, which is a horrific thought. But it's something we now know that the military industrial links still to this day keep a lot of American industry uh, uh, going. Mm. Um, okay, um, I have in the back, and keep your hands up just until I acknowledge you. Uh, since you oh, sorry. Uh, um, okay. Um, let me, uh, I want to ask you a question about your book. Um, and of course, I, I do want to thank you because I think if we're going to have hope, it should be based on something. And I think we're not religious uh, here. I mean, some people may be, but we're a secular movement of the left, and I think it has to be based on knowing how the hell we got into such a fucking mess. Um, so thank you. And I guess I want to ask you, you, you started off the whole talk tonight talking about how the Russian Revolution was the first and only revolution at that time that went into revolution with a plan and organization and a thought about how to transform themselves but also the entire world in doing it and then went on to talk about the very brilliant people went on to lead various communist parties around the world to disaster, to Stalinist disaster and exceeding to what is from your because I see the chapters, I'm very excited about reading this. It's sort of a, a a sort of tour through the wreckage of Stalinism from Hungary and China and on and on and on. What is the central feature that you see as running through this wreckage of these parties? Is it primarily the deracination from class struggle? Is it that in combination with so many other factors that there is no one? What is it that you conclude as being if it's possible, if that's too simplistic a way of yeah. trying to ask well, you to narrow it down. You know, in my opinion, of course, this is a huge debate. It was a combination of two things. One, of course, that the revolution was isolated. Second, that the working class was the working class and the forces that had made the revolution were either exhausted or dead, killed during the civil war. What's often not known, but some scholars have now told us and found the evidence, is that a lot of the most active Russian workers, the most politically advanced, went into the Red Army to fight off the whites. They needed these elements to, to politicize. Lots of them were killed. The combination of that created a mood in which people were ready almost to accept anything for a quiet life politically. And for me, the central uh, problem with the revolution was that it failed to institutionalize Soviets and the instruments of workers' democracy, which did exist. This was the most original thing, if you like, within the political structures that were thrown up, because Tsarism was a, you know, di a absolutist dictatorship. The Soviets were a response by workers and other sections of the community to create a popular sovereignty. And the revolution wasn't, even Lenin understood that very well. It was only when the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets that they went for power. They said, now we have a majority. So they understood the need for this. This was, you know, for reasons which outlined, disappeared. So I think political democracy is absolutely key mm -hmm. for the success of socialism and socialist upheavals and revolutions. That's the key lesson that has to be learned. Economically, we'll have problems. You know, who won't? But as long as you have political democracy, which is more meaningful now than capitalist democracy, which we see what it's producing, I think we're lost. So I think that it is on the level of political structure that socialism has to be taken forward. And, you know, admit it, I mean, I always say, you know, not demagogically really, but because I mean it, the number of times capitalism has failed yeah. doesn't. Socialism has failed once, and they told you, you never, never have it again. Well, you know, we will have it again, lots, somewhere. Yeah, thanks. Um, to review, uh, maybe the connection between uh, really the loss, it like the loss of the working class losing power in the Soviet Union, basically, to the party, basically, because they were not able to object, they were not able to express themselves, express that they were in the world, we're in the wrong direction. So, and the right, the right worldwide, the bourgeoisie, has made that linkage now, dictatorship and socialism. When you say socialism or communism. You know, the, the, 
they're linked to this, this um, lack of democracy. How can we decouple that going down the road? How can we liberate socialism from this, this, this stigma of really... Um, well, you know, it is difficult to uncouple it in the abstract. <clears throat> we will need an example, which is why I've argued, you know, forcefully over the years that whatever the limitations of the process in Venezuela, it was very democratic. And this is the one area in which we've actually struck at uh, the right, the center right and the center left, by showing them concretely that the Venezuelans put into practice the most democratic constitution in the world, saying if you collect so many signatures, you have the right to recall a president. This is straight out of the Paris Commune, and I know that that was where the ideas went from. So from our point of view, that has been very good, because even the people who hate the Venezuelan leadership know that that's true. So you had 99 or 95% of the private media, which is watched by a majority of the population, allowed to function. Even after they prepared to organize a coup d'etat, many told Chavez, for God's sake, can you imagine what would have happened in any Western country had a television network organized? He said, we don't care about that. You know? I mean, obviously we're not like that. So they didn't even banned that television and arrested who were organizing an armed insurrection against an elected government. Were well, allowed to carry on. Many people privately said, you know, at least some examples should have been made. A few generals involved in the coup should be executed. He said, no, let them leave the country. Let them go to Miami. Much better that way. <laughs> <laughs> so these for South America were very important examples. And in fact, you know, uh, I even said at a public lecture in Havana, I said, you have strengths and the Venezuelans have strengths, and you should learn from each other's strengths, not weaknesses. And I said the strength of the Venezuelans is that they have shown it is possible on the basis of mass mobilizations, which were very important, uh, to create a social democracy within capitalism. I said it's not going far enough. It's not like you, who've sort of totally rubbed out capitalism, but at a cost, too. Uh, it's not going like that, but you, can, you have a lot to learn. And this debate now does take place in South America. And a lot of South Americans say we didn't win through the armed struggle, which would have been nicer, but we are beginning to win some things back. But elsewhere in the world, there's very little uh, like that. So that's how the decoupling it's the only way I can see the decoupling taking place. I mean, the one European country, I, I don't want to exaggerate this, but where it could have happened and it might still happen is Greece, where you had the sudden rise of a left-wing socialist alliance of groups and parties, which jumped from a piddling percentage coming very close to taking power. And the European bourgeoisie panicked. Every single leader went to Greece to frighten the Greek people. If you vote for Syriza, you're finished, you'll starve, there won't be any more medicines left for you. And still they came within a whisker of winning. Now, the question is, what would they have done had they won? <laughs> And this is the big debate which carries on. Many of us said in Greece um, that key, you know, important measures have to be taken. You quit the euro yourselves, re-establish the drachma, institute immediately a form of, let's call it, social planning to make sure that no Greek starves, etc., yeah, yeah. etc. Et and you know, better economists than me had drafted out whole programs, which are still being discussed. And it's partially as a response to this that you had the state elements within the state security backing the fascists. Because the Greek fascists, as they are and should be called, have strong support inside the paratroopers and inside the special police within Athens, which go back a long way, actually. They have a history. So it's. It's the one country where there is a critical situation still, and we, we, we shouldn't give up on that. When Cyprus was speaking, oh. he, oh, sorry. sorry, we, we sorry, have sorry, such sorry. limited time. We want to hear from as many people as possible um, questions. 
So I have, unfortunately I only have time for about two more questions, but like I said, this can be the beginning, not the end of the discussion. So in the back in blue, followed by um, the banner. Yeah, thank you so much, it was great. Um, a couple of related, or comments related to a question. I really appreciated what you said about Lenin's last will and testament. I'm currently reading um, actually the fourth Congress of the Common Term Proceedings, and Lenin gives one of his last speeches, and one of the things he says over and over again is, we've done foolish things. No doubt we've done foolish things. We've made mistakes. And then he says, but we've done foolish things for this reason, because you guys have encircled us, yeah, yeah. because we've gotten no support, et cetera. What you guys do is for all the wrong reasons. And one of the things that comes across over and over again is this sense of like narrowing time and narrowing constraints mm -hmm. and being able to figure it out. Um, but also that things were still open and things could have gone a different direction. And I was struck what you said at the end, and I really agree about like Egypt and Occupy and that sentiment, that, like organization in itself, politics in itself, debate in itself, somehow leads to dictatorship, that we'll have a pure, spontaneous revolution this time, a flowering. Um, and I'm wondering if like the talk you gave in this process of uncovering how did Stalinism come to be, what is that legacy, what are those, you know, what was the reality in a more dynamic, complex understanding of what took place? Is that also part of contributing to a political project of rebuilding that kind of left that's not tied to the center left that we see today? Because I do think there's a radical left emerging, but it feels so politically tied down, underconfident, unopened, that could put socialism back on the agenda and, you know, restore a democratic reputation of socialism, but is, is afraid to do so. So I guess I wonder, what you see about the prospects for that and the role of books like this and talks like this, etc. Look, I mean, I've been talking about that. I'm not going to repeat myself, but I think these, you know, the fact that socialism is being debated again, and alternatives are being discussed today, not just by us or small groups of people, but by huge mass movements in parts of Europe, especially Greece. I have to stress that not so much in Italy or Spain or Portugal. I, I, it's uh, regrettable, which, but the reason they aren't is, and here too, you know, you have to say that it's because in, in, um, in, in Spain and Italy and Portugal, where you've had huge groupings on the left, many young people there see these groupings as tainted because they have collaborated with one or the other of the parties in power. And the people in Syriza, in Greece, never did that. They are not tainted by that. And as a result of that, they were able to say it and attack both and say, yeah, PASOK has been a complete disaster for us in Greece. So th this is what I stressed in my talk, that one must never underestimate the importance of politics. And, and, you know, being very clear about what the aims are, whether you're in a minority, it's sort of irrelevant. You have to fight for that. I mean, look at the speed with which Syriza developed in a huge social crisis, from being a tiny minority who people were laughing at into a party on the, on the threshold of winning state power, admittedly within the framework of elections, but that's the only way at the moment. And South Americans have shown that too. And again, on the basis of mass mobilizations. So, and the, the other thing to be stressed is that one thing that damaged the Greek left was there were some incredibly sectarian proto-Stalinist currents living in dreamland. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just horrific, really. I mean, I was shocked. I went to Athens before the elections to speak at the Polytechnic, which is a historic site where students were killed under the dictatorship. About you know, a few thousand people there. And at one point when I was saying the sort of things I've been saying to you, but more centered on Greece, I said, I get the feeling that not all of you are going to vote for Syriza in this election. Mm -hmm. So can we just have a show of hands? Who is going to vote for Syriza? <laughs> and to, to my relief, three quarters of the people did because they were not attached to some of the sectarian groups. So the sectarians just sat like this. And afterwards there was a huge debate. And I said, guys and gals, these debates are not new. 
they've been taking place within the left for, for, for at least 150 years. And this is the last thing we need is any form of sectarianism. We have to unite forces, not divide our already weak forces. And just because Syriza has done it and you couldn't, that is not a reason not to vote for them. <laughs> So uh, before I call on the last question, um, I'm really sorry to everybody who had their hands up that we weren't able to get to today, um, but we should stick around after, like I said. Um, and I just want to make a quick pitch. If you, if you like this event, if you like the books that Haymarket Books puts out, you should absolutely check out the Socialism Conference this summer in Chicago. There's information on the table in the back. Um, the Center for Economic Research and Social Change, which publishes Haymarket Books and the magazine, the International Socialist Review, is a sponsor of the conference. It's going to be a whole weekend of, of discussion and debate, and people should absolutely check it out. So we'll have um, the gentleman in red. In the last He's talked about a number of elections, and I think it's only about two weeks till the Pakistan election. I wonder if you could say something about neutral. Pakistan. Pakistan. Oh. It's about two weeks away, right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't hold back. <laughs> Look, uh, the elections. <laughs> Uh, there is no left force in the country, okay? <laughs> effectively. They're small groups, well-meaning and nice people. But <laughs> there is no effective political force on the left in Pakistan. So you essentially have the situation as follows. You have two political parties. Uh, one which is in part the People's Party, which is uh, being supported by uh, Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton for the last five years, which is one of the most corrupt parties in the country. But when I say that, I really mean it. That the, <laughs> the president of the country openly makes money. Is it 10%? Yeah. Well, 10% is, you know, an old joke, and it's not an accurate joke. The figure clo is closer to 40 to 50%. And so he's a billionaire many times over. And it's, it's not even a secret. You know, we have hundreds of instances of the way they make money. So people are fed up with them. The alternative is a, I, you know, left and right have no meaning in this, or center left or center right. The other gang is a gang of old crooks who've been making money under the military dictatorship for ages, the Sharif brothers, who are, the opinion polls are showing them uh, ahead so haven't helped the country. Uh, and you know, for the last 25 years, it's these two different gangs who whenever their elections come to power and make money. Mm -hmm. And they almost, there's nothing to choose between them. The third force that has come up is difficult to define in conventional terms. Mm -hmm. It's a political party called the Movement for Social Justice led by Imran Khan, who was a huge sporter superstar. Uh, it's, you know, I don't know American football or baseball very well, but if a huge star from that milieu, very popular with the masses, stood for president uh, against the Democrats and the Republicans on a mildly social democratic program. That is what is happening. And the program of this party is effectively free health, free education, subsidized housing building of free schools and universities. That is no doubt. Uh, ending of corruption, well, how do you do it? But OK, at least it's a central slogan. And on foreign policy, removing Pakistan's complete dependence on the Pentagon and the United States and reviving some national sovereignty and not doing everything the United States tells us to. It's all moderately framed. Now, the interesting thing about this party is that it is backed by the young people. Its main support is the urban youth because they don't see anything else. Uh, they effectively like him, they like the program, and if they turn out and vote, who knows? I mean, it could upset the apple cart. It really could. Or even if this becomes the sort of second largest party and is in the opposition. The reason that's important is it opens up a new space for pol politics and political debate. And people feel we can do something. You know, we've got rid of these guys. Uh, 
I met him, you know, I know him quite well, and uh, I said, what is the party organization like? And he surprised me. He said, look, this is really going to shock you, but we made a public appeal on television and the press saying all those who support our program, will you please register as party supporters or members? And he said, I'll just show you the latest registration figure. And he you know, clicked his iPhone. And at that point, when we were having dinner, 7.1 million people had registered. So I said to him, this, is, this truly is unprecedented in the whole subcontinent. If 7.1 million people have registered to back you, I mean, if they drag four more, each of them drags four people out, you, you almost won. In, he said, well, look, maybe, maybe not, but that is the figure. The second thing which is permitted is for part constituents of the party, party branches to determine who they want to be their members of parliament, which has meant that in a whole number of regions where bandwagon careerists and others jumped on, the young activists have kicked them out uh, and have elected their own nominees. So it's the only interesting thing, by the way, is to see how many votes this party gets. Not because you know one agrees with everything they do, but at least it, it will open up something different. Uh, so, I mean, I created a bit of a storm when I went in, at a big event in Lahore just several weeks ago. They said, who would you vote for? So I said I wouldn't vote for any of the major parties. And all the young people at the Law Literature Festival cheered and applauded. And then said, but if you were forced to vote, I said, I suppose, given what we've got, I would vote for this party, just to defeat the two others. And the whole place erupted. So I said, well, if that's the mood you're in, it's up to you, really. Because you know, <laughs> my vote doesn't count, and I'm not even going to vote. Uh, but you people can do this. So there is that atmosphere. I mean, in past elections, votes in Pakistan have been bought. Yeah. I'm not joking. I mean, literally, you go into a village, you go into poor areas, and uh, touts from both parties come and say, look, we'll pay you, you know, a thousand rupees for our vote, per vote. And the other guy comes and say, no, we'll pay you 2,000 rupees. So there's an auction. Open auctions. And so the people who offer more money usually win. This time, the election commission has declared a lot of people illegal and said if they, we're going to have people everywhere, if this happens, the candidate on whose behalf the money is being given will be disqualified. We'll see. We'll see. The, the good thing is that the Pakistani press, believe it or not, is much more open than the Indian press and much more than the American press. I mean, huge arguments and debates take place. All these politicians are confronted by opponents, by journalists questioning them, Imra, all of them are. And quite some of them are quite hard and cynical journalists who do it. And that is actually creating a political consciousness that I have not seen for a long, long time in that country. So, you know, we will see.